where do I start? What are the, some of the small things that I can do every day to chip away at this? Having disabled people involved in the process and the outcome, that provides um, community ownership and problem solving. Sharing power and co-design um, with women and girls with disabilities. The more voices we have within the conversation, the better outcomes we'll get. Text, get real number five. Prevention principles for daily use with women with disabilities. Our Watch and Women with Disabilities Victoria acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands across Australia on which this work was created. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples past and present. We acknowledge women with lived experience of disability and gender-based violence and the experiences of carers, families and supporters. The participants in this video speak individually while seated within a studio. Hi, my name is Annabelle. I am an occupational therapist and a disability advocate and I live with multiple invisible disabilities. My name is Christine. I'm a disabled woman. My pronouns are she and her and I work as an equality advocate. Hi, Yama. My name is Renee. I am a proud Birupai Dungadi woman. My pronouns are she, her and I am an artist, an advocate and a mum. Hi, I'm Laura. Um, my pronouns are she, her, um, and this is my lovely motorised wheelchair, Stella. <laughs> Hi, my name's Talitha, and I identify as a proud, queer, disabled woman. Text. How to prevent violence. Prevention principles allies can use daily. To me, the prevention principles come from a place of acknowledging that there are barriers, that there are inherent beliefs and systems which are creating environments and encouraging people to behave in a way which is discriminatory, is ableist, is often violent. And knowing that taking those underlying beliefs, those underlying systems and changing them is gonna take time. Most people, when confronted with a policy, find it really hard to actually figure out where to start. Um, and the daily principles are there to help guide, where do I start? What are the, some of the small things that I can do every day to chip away at this? Even if you don't have a disability, it's highly likely that you're going to encounter disabled people in the line of your work. Having those principles in mind and what organisations that do advocate for are trying to achieve, gives you a bit of an idea on how you might be able to make some small changes in your workplace to align with those principles to help the cause of disabled women who are victims of ableism and gender inequality. One of the, the most important things that I've seen has actually been to, to centre the experience of people with disabilities in the work that is done, um, to include and collaborate and co-design with people with disabilities so that projects are working from, from a, a ground up approach. Having disabled people involved in the process and the outcome, that provides um, community ownership and problem solving. We recently did a co-design um, of a program. It was amazing because it wasn't being written by other people to, and give, left up to them to determine what they thought disabled people needed to feel safe. It was up to us to say all of these things make us feel unsafe and this is how we can fix those problems. So that co-design where it involves the community in identifying the problem and determining how to overcome the problem is absolutely crucial. What co-design does so beautifully is it combines multiple voices and it acknowledges diversity because disability will never be a homogenous field and the more voices we have within the conversation the better outcomes we'll get. One of the principles that I use most um, in my work and uh, in my day-to-day -day life would be um, the notion of sharing power and co-design um, with women and girls with disabilities, both in my work as a plain language and easy read content writer. So uh, by actively um, 
asking women and girls with disabilities to read over the content that I create um, and to make sure that um, it aligns with and accurately represents their feedback and is as accessible as possible. Um, and uh, crucially, I pay them for their time um, because as we know, um, lived experience is expertise and deserves to be remunerated accordingly. That sharing of power and that, I guess, dissemination of decision-making and leadership and authority, um, again, is crucial to shaping a world that truly meets the needs of women and girls with disabilities. I think particularly where we look at the women with disabilities around us and the strengths that they have and bring those into the conversation. The co-design project, we had four women with disabilities working together on how we could audit and provide training to businesses to help them better understand where they were at in terms of creating an inclusive business, having passive discrimination built into their business and how they could slowly work to change that. One of the things that I really notice being both queer and disabled is that often even within my disability community or within my queer community, you still need to create space for yourself and for others like you. A lot of queer spaces are not disability inclusive. A lot of disability inclusive spaces are not queer inclusive. We've been working towards trying to have um, spaces where queer people with disabilities are coming together and talking about their experiences and having, having a space whereby being included is an expectation rather than an add-on. For example, organisations like the festivals where we're working towards upping the minimum amount of access we get. Um, it's about also creating spaces where that inclusion is, assumption, is an assumption. I've been uh, taking part in a co-design project uh, recently um, and I was asked from the beginning what my access needs were. That in itself is not uncommon, um, to have those access needs respected um, at a level where I both felt and knew that I was safe um, is not as common. Um, and so to see that being respected, to see that, yes, in this case, my disability means that I might be might need to be treated differently as a consequence of reasonable adjustments or access needs. Um, and to be shown that that's not a burden, um, that's not a chore, that's my right. Who are our service users? What considerations and improvements do we need to make to our service? And also so that we can ensure that there is adequate information recorded about the person for their whole journey with our service. We have time allocated for people who might not communicate verbally, um, who might use um, assistive communication devices, um, or making sure that we've budgeted for Auslan interpreters or captioners. We share power crucially by making decisions not based on what we as a, a service think is the right or appropriate uh, course to take, um, but guided primarily by what uh, young people with disabilities, including women and girls with disabilities, tell us what they would like to see and what they need. It's about reassuring people that everybody is included. Use the model of the social model of disability or, or the human rights model of disability. Is the person who is going to be running this business able to access everything they need to do that? Is the person who is coming to this community workshop able to access those things? It's the whole essence of it. Is that is the person or the people most impacted by this, are they at the forefront of what we're doing? We got state government funding and local council funding and as a part of that, we had to go out and develop the program, report the findings to justify the funding and to let the funders know what we learned from it. It did identify that this, there's a gap in the market and it's those people who believe their existing efforts are enough or don't see the need to make any 
extra accommodations to women or girls with disability. So it was very successful, but identified we still have a long way to go. For too long, we've lived in a world that has been shaped by people who don't have our lived experience. We see it um, across all elements of our society um, and we can change that. Changing the landscape um, is a blueprint that shows us how that change can begin. What we need is ways in which we can talk about not just what is going wrong, but actually how we can individually influence something that a lot of the time can seem too big for most people to even conceptualise, let alone start to do anything about in their daily life. What the prevention principles can and should do is provide that hope and, and reassurance that even the smallest thing you do to make change will have a positive influence on even if it's just one person. As a person with a disability, I hang on to every positive experience I've had with a death grip because I have so few of them. But if they were more common, I actually wouldn't need to do that. I would have less bad experiences than I had good experiences. And once that balance changes, I have so much more hope. I have so much more space to interact with systems. I have so much more patience. And what they offer people is the opportunity to do so. A roadmap for being able to approach these difficult and complicated things with just a bit more knowledge, just a bit more grace. Text. This video is part of a suite of Changing the Landscape practice resources, produced in partnership by Our Watch and Women with Disabilities Victoria and supported by the Australian Government Department of Social Services. We thank every project participant that has helped to make this practice resource series. Thank you for generously and boldly sharing your experiences, expertise, and for your leadership in calling for much needed change. Visit ourwatch.org.au or search Changing the Landscape online to find out more about our work and steps everyone can take to prevent violence against women and girls with disability. Violence is not inevitable, it is preventable. Our Watch, Women with Disabilities Victoria.